Ladies and gentlemen, we'll get started with our next panel. We began developing computers over 60 years ago, and then later the ability for those computers to network. Fast forward to now, and countless cyber activities take place at the speed of light every second around the globe. Those who are charged with detecting, protecting, and responding to malicious cyber activity are finding the battle space increasingly crowded and increasingly active. Thus, we are now depending more and more on computers to help us make informed decisions on cyber and counter cyber actions. The question needs to be asked, should humans be in the loop for timely decisions on handling cyber security threats in real time? Can humans even be expected to cope with this blinding digital vortex? Our moderator for this panel is Jim Kohlenberger. Jim is the president of JK Strategies and serves as executive director of Jobs for America. Previously, he was chief of staff for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, served eight years in the Clinton White House as senior domestic policy advisor to the vice president, and launched the Voice on the Net, or Vaughn Coalition, and served as its executive director, representing more than two dozen high-tech companies and working to advance technologies that improve communications over the internet. Mr. Kohlenberger, the floor is yours. Well, thank you much. And sorry, I just smacked the microphone. But, you know, this title, Humans Wanted, Humans need to, Needed, the Future of, of uh, Cyber. And it reminds me of that thing my wife always tells me when I've done something wrong. You know, men, you can't live with them, you can't live without them. And that's sort of where we're at with cybersecurity and humans, right? We often can't secure a network with them, and we can't secure a network uh, without them. And, you know, when you think about it, oftentimes in cybersecurity, we often look first for a technological um, solution. And indeed, cyberspace itself is an amazing testament to our technological uh, progress. Yet cyberspace is fundamentally uh, uh, an, an enabler. Uh, it's a reflector of us, and it's an empowerer um, of our human potential. And yet we're all human, and we make mistakes. And some of those mistakes lead to really bad problems. Within the uh, government, some of our worst cyber challenges have been simply when someone has inadvertently plugged a USB drive into a computer or clicked on a phishing uh, attack that they shouldn't have uh, uh, clicked on. And so humans were some of, one of the biggest challenges, and at the same time, we're also some of the biggest potential, I think, in, in cyberspace. It's our ideas and, and innovation. It's our talent and tenacity. Uh, it's all of these things that uh, help us uh, out-innovate and out-compete our cyber adversaries. And, and this innovation is, is in part driving those next big things. And so we've got an excellent set of panelists here um, to talk about both our human challenges and our technological uh, opportunity. And these guys are on the, on the front lines of developing and delivering some of the most uh, incredible technologies, I think, that are in... Uh, the, the cyber domain and their experts in uh, in this area. And so with that, first I want to uh, uh, introduce Peter George, who's uh, president of General Dynamics Fidelis uh, Cybersecurity Solutions, and really is known as one of the real forward-thinking leaders in, in cybersecurity. We've also got Steve Hawkins, who's uh, the vice president for uh, Information Security Solutions, a business use unit of uh, Raytheon Companies Intelligence and Information Systems. And he's one of the real visionaries in this um, field. And we've got all, we also have Dr. Antonio Nucci, the chief technology officer of NERUS. And he's really been at the forefront of developing some future-focused uh, technologies. And I want to start with a little bit of a, of a scene setter. And, you know, every panel today, I think, has talked about people, uh, about our human uh, challenges that we have in, uh, in cybersecurity. And, you know, the biggest challenge in the network is often that part that sits between the chair and the keyboard. Um, and Verizon did a, a study last year, and they found that of all the breaches in cybersecurity, 97% of them were actually fairly easy uh, uh, simple uh, breaches. That most of them were uh, human uh, challenges. You know, we click on things we shouldn't. Uh, we plug USBs in when we when we shouldn't. We use peak, uh, uh, easy passwords. And I know statistically uh, out there, some of you use your dog's name, your favorite team. Uh, you use uh, an anniversary date. And there's even statistically at least a couple of you who use password one two three. Um, and we know who you are. Uh, 
but we can do better, right? We don't uh, do patches when, when we should. We, um, we don't do configuration controls. We don't isolate cyber physical systems uh, when we should. And we are part of the challenge. And so it's, it's often said, I think, in, in this world that um, uh, in the hacking world that an amateur attacks machines and a professional attacks people because we're actually part of that uh, weakest uh, link in, in the domain. We only we have to be right 100% of the time. They only have to be right once uh, in that world. So, so given that, uh, we want to talk about, you know, so I want to throw this out there. Given that our human frailty uh, is out there, how do, what do we need to do in this world where 97% of our biggest, you know, of our um, uh, challenges come from us? So I think that, um, um, so people, uh, uh, a critical component of uh, any network security defense system at the end is uh, it doesn't matter if we're talking about uh, and uh, one, you know, one person enterprise like, uh, you know, me at home or like uh, uh, being in charge of, uh, of an enterprise of a government of a, or a nation. So everything starts with people and ends with people. So it is very, very important uh, that uh, we start to pay attention uh, on uh, people and I'm going to talk about uh, three, three bullets here. As much as we pay attention to uh, operational uh, protocols and procedures, and we keep investing in technology. So um, actually, I have another uh, interesting statistic. I was reading uh, some news a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it says, uh, you know, well, all the big corporations, large enterprises, they do all have training. And all this morning session was all about uh, training is important, training is vital. Okay? But the problem is that like, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I was reading this news and said that 80 percent of all the, uh, the the breaches actually that happen uh, in the financial and utilities markets, they were actually uh, caused by people who were actually trained. So, what are we doing wrong? Maybe just is uh, we need to reinterpret how we train people. Train uh, is not just uh, a class to be taken, a class to pass. Some credits, uh, you know. Uh, to be scored. Uh, training uh, is, uh, is the most important thing. It uh, has to be thought as uh, in depth, 360 degrees, and it has to happen 24 7. Knowledge sharing, information sharing. So the second thing is uh, exposed to people only what people need to get exposed to. So no more, no less. So what I mean with that is that uh, there are uh, a lot of, uh, there is a lot of information, sensitive information, uh, access to, you know, to servers, uh, where are not really required uh, for any job duty for specific people, but still these people have uh, some access. So again, uh, reducing, uh, you know, give uh, the right access to people uh, with the, the proper role-based access control, attribute-based access control, can reduce uh, the risk of making a mistake. Because we're humans, we make mistakes, especially in this uh, multitasking environment that we live in, that we do 3,000 things at the same time. And the last bullet uh, is really is that uh, I think that uh, there is technology out there now that uh, can help uh, um, people in the process, like for example, um, I think that the technology of virtual desktop is very mature, correct? Moving away from your desktop, uh, do your daily, your daily operations into a virtual desktop in a contained environment where, uh, you, know, um, you, know, when, you know, access to registries, files, or keys uh, can be, you know, retrieved, can be, can be seen, where if anything goes wrong, it's self-contained. Uh, you know, virtual machines are easy to clean. So I think that also the technology, not just the training, can help people, uh, you know, in uh, uh, in carrying out uh, successfully their uh, their job, if their daily job, while at the same time uh, minimizing the risk of uh, of, uh, of mistakes. So it's a combination of uh, training, it's a combination of uh, filtering out what they don't need to have access to, and uh, there is technology out there that shall be used, and we need to start using. Uh, you know, to uh, help you know people, uh, you know, to uh, to minimize the risk of making mistakes. Um, you know, I kind of agree with the points you're making. And by the way, I'm, I have worked on this system. I'm password four three two one. So, I'm <laughs> uh, the the uh, uh, I, I didn't agree, and, and and we'll get a little more into uh, some of the you know technology and engineering talents needed for it, and uh, and uh, both from an operational standpoint. But um, being part of a of a, of a company that's a pretty large enterprise itself, 
uh, about 70,000 people. Uh, you add that, we, um, one of the, the solutions we put out there is on insider threat um, cyber audit. And, and I can tell you it's per, across hundreds of thousands of, of, of desktops. Um, so uh, last year when I was here, I talked a little bit about, you know, on a panel about human dimensions, and I, and I said 5% of the people, this is our data, will click on anything. I don't care if it says, don't click on this, they're gonna click on it. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing, but, but, but I will say that, um, and, and so you kind of reach a, and that's after a lot of training, you do kind of reach a, a, a point where you're gonna have still issues with, uh, with social engineering. I can tell you within our, uh, within our own company, after extensive amount of, everyone takes online training an hour every year, and it's, it's actually, actually quite good. But um, so I, I've seen that go from 5% to two and a half, but no, nonetheless, there still is some finite number that is, uh, is still at risk. Um, and what I will say is just from a, from a human dimension, if you look at, um, at your adversaries or the attackers or those that are trying to, uh, to go, come after your enterprise, um, you know, they're, they're looking for the easiest way in, right? They're not looking for the hardest way in. We tend to put a lot of technology and want to make a lot of investment around the hardest way to get in. They're looking at simple ways. So, um, you know, j just when it comes to the human dimension, what you should be asking yourself is why does someone want a certain amount of IP? Who wants it? What do they want it for? Or if it's a denial of service attack, who would it be? What are they trying to do? Um, you got to sit back and look at that whole human dimension of what someone is trying to do to you, and then just look at the cyber aspect of it. Um, and, and if you can try to address in those areas what is a likely attack, you'll, you'll hit a lot of them off. So, um, but, but I tend to agree. I mean, um, when we, we in our own uh, networks, when, we, you know, when the training isn't sufficient, uh, we do have those cyber audit tools and insider threat tools. And what we do is we literally monitor how you operate per policies. And if you violate a policy, it lets you know. If you violate a policy and continue, it lets your supervisor know and you get a call. Um, it does kind of direct us in on where we need um, additional training to be done uh, or disciplinary action, right, to, to be taken. So uh, I think it's important because it, even as we get, you know, the, the, you know, your first line of defense is, is all the people across your enterprise. And so the better you can make them, the better off you'll be. But, but even when we get in more sophisticated operational environments, you know, there, there's con ops and uh, techniques and procedures you're trying to follow and you got to know where those issues are so that you can go in and do point training and so some form of tools or cyber audit capability to see if if folks are following those techniques you know if they're not maybe maybe there's a good reason maybe they're they're actually doing the the right thing from a security standpoint you need to modify your procedures but but you got to have some kind of feedback mechanism to really optimize that So just to add to the, <clears throat> the comments here, so I spent six years running a company called Fidelis uh, Security Solutions. We're now part of General Dynamics. Um, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of General Dynamics, and we've been very, very focused for almost 10 years on the issue of protecting intellectual property, protecting classified information. And when we think about the human element in, in, in this regard, you know, we think about, we think at, in it in terms of the seven layer ISO model and the eighth layer um, is the carbon layer which is the human person and it's the most vulnerable part of that ISO model. Um, on the flip side the adversary an advanced persistent threat is not a what it's a who it's somebody that's attacking very specifically the the data that you're pr trying to protect. Um, <clears throat> we just had a bunch of customers in for a customer advisory meeting. These are big commercial customers like GlaxoSmithKline and MetLife and some banks. And when we asked them out of all their data and all their users, what's the most sensitive? And they would tell you 5% of their data is really sensitive. Unfortunately, most of them don't know where it all is. And so when you don't know where it all is, there's lots of attack surface for the, for the, for the, person attacking you to try to get in and attack the data. So number one is um, education. We heard it already, making sure people understand the processes around dealing with social networking because that's one of the most common ways 
that attackers or adversaries penetrate a network. Um, two, technology, not only technology to lock down the sensitive data, uh, but also to monitor who does and doesn't have rights to it. And three, uh, um, security monitoring, to monitor uh, how people are behaving, um, both inside the network, but also people trying to penetrate the network. So it's education, it's technology, and it's training. And so this morning, uh, uh, DHS Secretary Janet Napolitano wrote an op-ed, I think, highlighting this human dimension as the number one challenge um, that DHS is facing. And, and a couple years ago, they did this uh, experiment. They took some thumb drives and they sprinkled it around their uh, parking lot and the parking lot of some, of some contractors. And sure enough, 60% six, of people plugged them into the, the network. And of course, if it had a logo, 90% uh, uh, did and likewise, you know, the DoD CIOs I think sent about 2,000 fake phishing emails. Uh, I don't know how to say <laughs> fake phishing email, but uh, sent those out to employees, and about 50 percent of people uh, clicked on them. Uh, uh, what, you know, when they shouldn't have. So those are you know social engineering things. But now we're seeing just last week um, there was this uh, attack between. Uh, spam house and uh, cyber bunker, and and this is this thing. BBC called it the largest ever uh, cyber attack in in history. Some of my cyber nerds say no, it's not, but <laughs> um, uh, but nonetheless, these guys used this set of open resolvers. These were uh, 27 million machines around the networks in uh, in businesses, in agencies, in in people's homes, and people unwittingly became uh, uh, attackers that help amplify this thing a hundredfold. How do we deal with a world where we don't even know we're part of the problem? Should I start? So I think that, uh, so, uh, so uh, you're you really raising a good point. It's like how can, uh, can uh, you defeat an attack uh, that was uh, so well orchestrated, uh, organized, uh, you know, who knows how long it took to compromise all these machines and uh, when uh, you know it's already too late, you know, and uh, you know just because maybe they want you to know. If they go are going after sensitive information, I'll guarantee you, you will never, you know, get to know that. Um, I think the only one way that you can really uh, cope with uh, and start playing a fair game is to start using uh, machines uh, uh, from a defense side as well. Uh, when I say machines, I mean uh, automation. I mean. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, so uh, to, to, today we live in a world where uh, people are still sitting on, the, for, on uh, the front seat. They are the ones to dig and sift uh, through a uh, huge amount of data. They are asked to make decisions. Uh, time lags, uh, you know, are very long, uh, very, very ineffective. Maybe it's just uh, to cope with, uh, you know, if we get attacked uh, with uh, uh, machines, let's have machines and automation. Let's, uh, you know, to fight back. And, uh, you know, so, the, the, the terms uh, of like uh, machine learning, machine to machine communication has been coined already for a couple of years. Uh, and now we start to see the first uh, system sit in the market. Uh, so when you have now a system that can really ingest a, a huge amount of information and uh, you can uh, program this system as, uh, you know, with exactly the same operational workflows that you used to take, uh, driven by people today, in the future are going to be driven by, by machines. And even the more sophisticated uh, analytics to find the needle in the eye stack. Uh, so no vendors in the middle. It just traffic in, decisions out. And the analysts will be called just to validate, verify, and then act. That is going to be a fair game. Yeah, I think what we're, uh, what we're starting to see, and we've, we've kind of experienced it, those that have worked on the, uh, in the defense industry, uh, probably financial institutions and a few others, but uh, uh, we're going to see more and more denial of service attacks, right? And we get maybe the most common, easiest kind of, of just flooding the front end of a system that, that you know, wasn't set up to, you know, it's like, hey, great, we're getting all this, you know, attention. But, but you know, the, 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 there are limits you can put on it and technological solutions you could, you could put into the front ends of your system uh, to address that. Matter of fact, my, you know, my co-panelists here both have great technology that are excellent at grabbing the wideband front ends and looking at uh, anomalous behavior and being able to give you the feedback with proper analytics around it 
to be able to address those things. So I think that's, uh, you know, as we, as we move talking a little more about uh, that interaction of humans and technology, uh, that level of automation uh, can catch a lot of those kind of attacks that uh, like, like we've seen. Um, <clears throat> so I think technology is a big piece of it, but uh, you know, really what we're talking about is protecting data. So in, instead of just locking down the human element or the carbon element, I think the job number one for every company, for every customer, for every federal agency is to understand where your classified information is, where your sensitive information is, where the data of your customers may arrive that, some, that somebody may want access to it, and make sure you lock it down. And um, whether you put it in one place, and we have many customers that ask us to go in and do a, a pen test and audit to help them understand where their information is, and some of them put it in one place and, and make sure that it's completely locked down. Um, for all the people in the room that were at the RSA conference this year, we participated in it in the last 10 years. I think we even discussed before the panel today, it was the most well-attended RSA conference in history, both by numbers of vendors. There were 800 security companies presenting, and there were hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of, of people coming through there um, and customers. This has really become a major issue for everybody. Um, and the, the lid really came off the advanced threat space when Mandian issued their report uh, about the Chinese stealing intellectual property. And, you know, 95% of the commercial Fortune 2000 companies have been compromised by a nation state or somebody. They're in our networks. So <clears throat> if the challenge really isn't not just how do we defend against them, but how do we lock down what they're after um, so that they can't use it to, for profit, which is really what they're doing. So there's a major war going on now, and really for the first time, I would say, as I said, we've been attending for 10 years. We have a common enemy, and it's almost the first time on these panels that you see a three-star general, um, a CISO in a blue suit, and, and a guy in ponytails and, and, and sandals, all trying to figure out how to stop the adversary. Because we have, this is a national security issue, and we have a common enemy, and we need to figure out how to lock down the data that they're after. So I would just argue, uh, whether you're involved or not, which is the original part of your question, understanding uh, what the adversary's after and making sure you protect it is job number one for every company. Yeah, Peter, I, I, I didn't agree. I mean, it all kind of starts, like you came up with the fundamental, you better know where your data's at, you better know what data you want to protect the most. Um, it all starts there, right? Because that's really, you, you, it is unaffordable to protect everything at the same level. Right at the maximum level, you have to have some partitioning of your architecture to, to look at. So I think that's an excellent point. So let's fast forward a little bit. You know, today is is uh, Cyber 1.3, but let's let's talk about Cyber 2.0, those next generation of, of technologies. I mean, computer firepower is rising, uh, uh, connectivity is becoming even more pervasive. Uh, uh, we're moving from a post PC world into a mobile PC world. Last year was the first time that we had more. Uh, smartphones sold than uh, PCs, um, and 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 we're moving in. Uh, you know, the, the pace of change in technology continues to uh, accelerate. We've been focused originally on a perimeter defense method, and then we went to a kind of a defense in depth method. What are the technologies and uh, and the things that you think are going to be important going forward? But I, I think first of all is uh, we need to understand. Uh, um, but once that question would take like three days, you know, so. But I would say it's like, uh, you, you, if we put it just uh, for now, is, uh, you know, uh, that uh, we're dealing with a more orchestrated, uh, more stealthy than ever kind of attacks. Very, very well organized, uh, very, very distributed. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, the internet cyber is really a very uh, easy to hide uh, place, you know. So 100 uh, million profiles on Facebook and, you know, so just to name one social platform. So easy today. But at the same time, if you look at also what uh, the problem that we're really facing on is how, to do, how do we deal with, this, uh, with the problem of big data, correct? Because uh, that is a very big challenge. If you just do the math, big data is like I like talking about the three Bs, uh, volume, variety, and velocity. 
But let's really start to understand what it means, uh, and then we can talk about what is required from a technology standpoint. If you look at the uh, like velocity, so uh, you know, uh, six, uh, you know, I would say like ten years ago, if you had a solution that could cope like uh, with a gigabit per second of uh, of real time streaming analytics, uh, you know, with behavioral based, uh, you were the king of the market. So. Uh, uh, one kilo, so one gigabit per second, uh, roughly 25,000 flows, one kilobyte per flow, you're talking about uh, 25 megabytes per second of traffic to be ingested in whatever platform we're talking about. Now multiplies times 100, 1,000, uh, even 100. You're talking about now 2.5 uh, gigabytes per second to be ingested on whatever platform that is supposed to do, run exactly the same kind of analytics. That's a big platform. 2.5 gigabytes per second. That is just the velocity, you know? So if you're in the business of running streaming analytics to catch the bad guy as they try to penetrate the perimeter, that is the traffic that we need to uh, look, you know, to watch for. Then you talk about volume. And uh, volume, you just take the 2.5 gigabyte per, per second, you multiply per day, is 216 uh, terabytes. Now you multiply for like, uh, you know, in a week, is, uh, you start talking about 1.5 uh, petabyte of data. Uh, do you guys remember Stuxnet uh, when we got it really bad? Uh, it took Symantec, it was the first one to come uh, to market with a signature, two weeks and three days. So now we're talking about three petabytes of data to be stored. And by the way, this is not like stored and archived, this is data that you need to access, correct? because you are still trying to recover and to try to find the needle in ice stack. That is the big data problem. And not even talk about the variety, the millions of applications that could be good or bad, who knows? You know, Facebook plus iOS slash Android. Uh, this is the problem. Bring your personal device, correct? This is the world that we live in. Poor IT guys, this is what I say every single day. Um, now it's like, uh, okay, first one, so the question is, uh, Real, uh, some refreshed platforms that can really cope with the uh, velocity, variety, and the uh, volumes of data. Then we talk about advanced analytics. Now we start talking about streaming, query-based, uh, AI kind of analytics that have to process uh, and automate the workflows that I was talking before. You know, how do you automate a reverse engineering of an application such that you know to automatically discover and uh, to reverse engineer on the, on the wire the millions of applications that might hidden in HTTP because of uh, you know these mobile platforms now. You cannot reverse engineering uh, these applications by hands. You need machines. That implies you need uh, some very powerful AI. Okay, and remember the data: three petabytes. I say three petabytes in two weeks. It's a lot. Uh, so um, this is what I would say: is like uh, invest, invest in platform invest, invest in analytics, uh, and invest, invest in automation. Uh, let, let me hit it from a couple ways. First, I'm gonna kinda come from a, where I think technology is going and, and, and how we're gonna have to adapt around, around using it. But uh, if you kinda look today, you know, so, so much had been built around, as you talked about, the uh, um, some, all forms of signature base, you know, different layers of defense. Um, you know, kind of where things are headed, and, and, and this is this is right now where they're headed. Is is that 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 still is a necessary thing? You do the best you can with that, but you've, you, the move now is to heuristics that can predict things without having the known signature, things that you're seeing for the first time. Right? That that that's the big push. That's the advanced analytics. It's the big data. I mean, that that's that's kind of up on us. I mean, it's not something where it's going to happen five or ten years from now. That's right up on us now. Um, I think where that will evolve to out in, in, in the four or five year time frame, maybe even faster because it just amazes me how fast this goes, is to go from just detection methods to prediction methods. And it kind of comes back to something we touched on earlier about um, uh, the, way, the way an adversary or a hacker thinks um, the, that they will come at you in the simplest way they can, not the most complex. So I think the range of tools and techniques that will have to be developed, you have to have the engineering talent to develop it, um, as well as uh, the operators will be around predictive approaches. I mean, we, we kind of know it in its old form as penetration testing of some sort, but kind of, you know, penetration testing on, on steroids, uh, highly automated ability to 
look at your system and be able to determine based on the way hackers think about a problem where you have vulnerabilities. So I think that is the is where the technology will evolve to. Um, it's a, it, there's a piece of it that's modeling and simulation. There's a piece of it, and you, and you always hear us, we always come from a perspective of you better think like the best attack to be the best defender. You're going to have to have people that understand both sides of that. Uh, we kind of call that full spectrum cyber these days because so many of the techniques that are used both for offensive cyber and defensive cyber are the same. Right, the, the, the technical things that you do um, in the technology and the tools. So I think, I think that's, that's where the technology will go. And it has, it's just a whole different level of thinking. I mean, it kind of goes back to, like I said, heuristics and artificial intelligence as we knew it, but, but really with the, with the uh, characteristics being of the way a hacker thinks. Um, so the, um, the other thing I wanted, uh, wanted uh, to mention about that, uh, architectures are going to become even more important. So. Um, if you take a look at what we've been doing, we've been trying to make all of our systems more secure. Uh, I heard a word used uh, during the lunch uh, speech today by General Heighton is we've been normalizing uh, what we have from, a, from an information infrastructure. And, and, and I think that's a good term because there was a great improvement in security and going from I don't know how many servers I have, where I have it, what data I have, you know, what end devices I have. You know, if I can get my arms around it and have some commonality of solution, then I can put whatever the best protection I have around it and improve my security posture quickly. And I, and I think that's accurate. And I think that's what's going on right now and what we're seeing. But, but um, we'll get to a point there that we will have done very well along that regard. But believe me, the hackers are going to find a way to break into that, right? There's always a different technique, a different trend, different ways they approach it. And so uh, as, after you get this normalized, um, you're going to have to sit back and think about more work in the areas of adaptable networks, um, you know, to, to be able to change things, more diversity. I mean, I think back to, uh, you know, to the early days when I worked in computer architecture, all the fault tolerant computing architectures or network fault tolerance. So, so I think normalized and controlled and knowing what you have and secured as best you can around that is good, but you better offer the adversaries a moving target or some form of diversity or they will just penetrate right through that. It'll be a speed bump to them. So I, th I think that's how technology will play on us uh, uh, as we look forward over the next three, four, five years. Let's see if I can add to that. <clears throat> um, so as it relates to the perimeter, um, so there is no perimeter anymore in any company, right? <clears throat> My perspective is that it's multiple perimeters collapsed around your, your data because it's about data protection. So understand where your sensitive data is and build a perim perimeter around that. So that's number one as it relates to what the new perimeter is. Um, in terms of big tr trends and the attack surface changing, you know, the, the big trends now and in the future continue to be social networking, mobility or BYOD, <coughs> of course the cloud, everyone's trying to move to the cloud, um, and then advanced threat defense and big data. Um, all of those make the attack surface a moving target. Um, it makes it really, really hard to do business because that's why people are deploying those technologies. People are doing it so that they can drive the top line, create profits, and run a better business. Um, but at the same time, it, the attack surface is, is moving and getting bigger, and the adversary has more ways into the network. So it's, it makes it very, very difficult today to be in the security space and to deal with these multiple business trends that are impacting how people need to secure their networks. Um, as it relates to dealing with this specific problem of big data and advanced threat defense, you know, we, I found it very interesting that for the six or seven years that I was running Fidelis, you know, we had this absolutely brilliant technology. Um, we were a technology company, and we focused in on the commercial market, but we had a lot of federal uh, agencies, 42, who had used us to protect their classified information. When I walk into Wall Street and go to Morgan Stanley or, or J.P. Morgan and talk about this problem, what was interesting is they were just as interested in our knowledge of the adversary from our work in the classified business than they were with our, with our technology. Because to deal with this adversary, you need the combination of three things. 
and everyone in the commercial market is now figuring it out. You need cutting edge technology, you need expertise, and you need threat intelligence of, on the adversary. And, and our three companies have people that have spent decades protecting classified information. We understand the adversary. And most of the commercial enterprises were worried about the hacker down the street for, for 10 years. They know how to build a perimeter network for that. But all of a sudden, when you're dealing with a nation state that happens to have an intelligence agency that's well-funded, and they have all the equipment that you have in your network, in their network, so they know how to circumvent it to get at your, at your data, all of a sudden the issue becomes really, really hard. So to come back around on, on the big data question, you know, I, I believe the next kind of evolution in big data is taking the combination of cutting edge technology, expertise, and threat intelligence that we as a, as a country have developed over the last 20, 30 years and put it into algorithms and heuristics so that we can anticipate and do counterintelligence uh, and fight the fight on their battleground, not on our networks, which is where it's happening today. And it's really a scary thought to think 95% of the commercial 2000 have been compromised. Scary. I mean, we're telling our customers, assume you've been compromised and make sure that you have tools to go hunt to make sure that you understand if they're in there and what they've taken. Because that's the, re the state of, of, uh, of the market today. And we're hoping that big data and this kind of ability to anticipate the moves of the adversary will really help us create situational awareness on our networks and protect our IP. So let me pick up on a couple threads here. So we've got you know, threat intelligence and, and, and big data. Uh, leading to these kind of heuristic uh, uh, technologies and all of this. And the, and the one thing in, in Washington where I come from, you know, the big watchword is information sharing, right? When I talk to CEOs, the number one thing they think that, you know, they need for, to be able to better protect themselves is a conglomeration of better information to better protect themselves. And we're fortunate, I think, after this to have Congressman Rubersberger here, who's one of the big uh, champions of a, a piece of legislation that I think they may even mark up uh, in the next week or so we'll hear from him. But, but in that information sharing thing, it's coming back to the people side, one of the, the challenges that uh, people introduce in this process is uh, privacy and civil liberties. How do you balance those sets of um, issues in the information sharing environment? Well, that's a very good point. Is, uh, so let me say it's like uh, <clears throat> with the, um, so let me take this up. Is, uh, Today, everybody, so I would say that uh, we complain and complain, correct? Uh, we complain because uh, when uh, there are companies that try to do to secure more personal assets or companies' assets, then we say we claim like network neutrality. So then we get breached, we lose, and then we say, where are my security vendors? So we need to find that uh, equilibrium point to try really to understand that what it can be shared versus what cannot be shared. And it's uh, very uh, foggy, I would say. The second is also, it's not just uh, try to understand what to share, but uh, try to understand how to share. So carriers do not share information. Security vendors uh, do not share information. Uh, and uh, system integrators are called uh, today to force uh, different technologies built in silos to share information. They call it correlation of post-process events, Siemens, 10 years old technology. So uh, even if you have all these, uh, these parties that are willing uh, to start sharing information, the, the semantic of the world to open their signatures and share these signatures with government, or technology that can reverse engineering applications on the wire, uh, you know, now you have signatures that you can uh, you know, flash back into the uh, you know, DPI that you bought. Uh, it's like a common formats, common APIs, common protocols. Is that we're really lacking even standards. There's no one single standard to say that vendors that want to share information shall use standard X. So what to share, equilibrium point, how to share, a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I tend to agree. I mean, if, if, you, if you look there, um, I mean, I kind of look at it from a privacy standpoint of if you if you have your organization, your company, whatever organization it is, um, um, you know the 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 workforce is there, you know, at will, 
right? And so within your own assets, you can you can kind of dictate, you know, what the rules are for the equipment that they're operating on, that they're doing to their day-to-day -day job. Um, and, and really what it comes down to is whether it's across industry or it's government to government, um, you know, you've, uh, you've, you've got to make a decision. Is there value in it for you sharing information about the threat? Now, now, you know, one of the things that everybody always worries about from a privacy standpoint, you don't even have to know content to find out what the threat is, right? Um, I always say, like we have time to look at content, right? But, but because the characteristics that you are trying to detect on are not content-based. They're what wraps around it. And just being able to boil that down to, uh, hey, be careful with something coming from that place, or be careful with something that exhibits these characteristics coming to you, is is you know just being able to educate, you know, really the world that that, that that's what what we're talking about when we're talking information sharing, right? We're not trying to look into what the content, um, you know, there's there's, you know, technology blocks that even can prevent that from being happening. Uh, or, or security provisions or privacy or policy or whatever, whatever organization is doing it. So you can separate the truth, the, the two. Um, it's no different than, than um, an individual worrying that someone's working in your HR department could give out their privacy data at a happy hour, right? I mean, it really, it, it, it just isn't, right? It, it, it's just, you've, it all is based on the integrity of individuals and you've got to be able to to be able to monitor that and be able to, to, to trust in people. But, but that's not what really this whole cybersecurity area is about. You don't need to know the content that's that privacy data to be able to do this information sharing. And, and I think there's just a, a huge misunderstanding around that. So a couple of thoughts here. You know, one of them is um, the, the big promise for Fidelis to come together with General Dynamics is you know, when I learned that General Dynamics manned U.S. CERT and manned DC-3 in conjunction with some other defense contractors, and, and they have just a wealth of knowledge on the adversary, it, for me, the lightning, the, the light bulb went off that we could take a first mover advantage and bring the combination of products, threat intelligence, and expertise to the commercial market because they're desperate for it, absolutely desperate. And I, I actually think your question is the right one. You know, I, this whole issue around sharing information and sharing threat intelligence is absolutely critical. Right. And I think, I mentioned the Mandiant report before, I think that's taken the lid off this problem. Right. Everybody was protecting their information. Nobody wanted to say they were breached. No, you know, it was the scarlet letter if you've been compromised. But if 95% of the people in the Fortune 2000 are, and we all have, all of a sudden we can finally talk about it. So I, I actually think we're going to look back on the, the most recent RSA, and that will be a defining moment, maybe a pivotal moment in the security space to say, that's when we started getting better at dealing with the adversary, because we were able to really share information. And you know, the Department of Homeland Security has a new program now. They're going out and asking a lot of the Fortune 1000 companies to participate to share information across the federal agency and the commercial agency, it will be anonymized. There's a way to do this without sharing content that you can anonymize um, your information and be able to share it. And we're seeing an enormous amount of momentum from commercial customers who want to participate in it. They want to get information from the federal government. They know they can't get classified information, but they, there's, there's hundreds of man years of information on how to deal with the adversary that the commercial market is so desperate for that now they're becoming vehicles and platforms for that to happen. And I think we're going to come a long way on dealing with this national security issue. And you know, I would argue that in the last five years, it's been the greatest transfer of wealth out of the country from the United States to other countries like China and Eastern Europe because they're just stealing it from us and we have to do something about it. I think sharing information is the cornerstone of maybe shifting that backwards. So let's talk about stealing. Often people talk about encryption. And, and so what are the values and the risks um, uh, around protecting data with encryption? Well, encryption is, uh, is uh, again, is, uh, you know, is uh, one of these technologies that, uh, <clears throat> 
that uh, has to be used, you know, to protect uh, our sensitive information. But at the same time, uh, again, put, let's put ourselves uh, more like on the other side of the equation. So just think about a vendor who is actually asked uh, to uh, provide uh, uh, um, application control on the network. So most of these applications uh, are attached to mobile platforms like uh, Symbian or Windows Mobile or iOS or Android. Most of uh, these applications, they use uh, HTTPS, encrypted. So how do you solve that problem, correct? If uh, uh, Apple or Google doesn't share the certificates, you cannot come up with uh, some very strong signatures. And if you don't know the applications, then uh, there's nothing that you cannot secure because uh, uh, visibility is the first one step to secure your infrastructure, your network. Think about now, if you don't know the application, how can you say whether an application is malicious or not? Um, so what I'm trying to say is uh, s s encryption is worth uh, for data at rest, is worth uh, for data transfer. But at the same time, the keys uh, shall be shared uh, you know, by government, carriers, content providers, application developers, because we are all on one side. And today, we are asked uh, to reverse engineering what people that are sitting on the same side of the table have been doing for a living. So we shall really focus uh, you know, to go after the bad guys, and we shall try to cooperate a little bit more on our side. So again, it's a, it's a double source kind of uh, issue. I would say any of us that have worked it for a number of years on the on the government side, I think you hit on a really really important point is uh, is that whole area of the uh, the overhead and efficiency of key management and key management techniques is is essential part of it and what you're willing to do from a from a keying structure. I mean, I'm, I'm I think I come from a perspective that that level of data protection or encryption at pretty low levels is 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 necessary to. Uh, to address the problem, but you're going to have to find the most efficient implementations for, and, and the willingness to share um, that key infrastructure in a very adaptable way before it, before it'll be effective. Otherwise, there'll be enough overhead implemented on it that that it will will bog down the uh, the information systems to a point that uh, I'd say that's the negative part. Is uh, so so I, I would be looking for technologies uh, and techniques that that drive that efficiency and, and there I've seen several that are starting to emerge uh, out there in uh, private industry my only addition to, to those thoughts are that uh, you get again getting back to understanding what information you want to protect you know that's the area that you should spend your time encrypting um, trying to encrypt all your traffic is just it's business prohibitive right. and nobody wants to do it and so, again, if you can identify 5% of your data and really lock that down, then you can use whatever technologies that are available today to protect it and still do business and do commerce the way we need to if we're going to be global companies and, and grow profit. I mean, so, I mean other, other ways to, to think about it, um, there's kind of some other technologies you can use. Um, uh, this whole kinds of, like, anti-tamper techniques, right? And um, uh, really what you got to find out, particularly on the applications, is is something changing when it's not supposed to be changing, right? So you can encrypt, but I'm just saying there are other approaches to make sure that something is not being varied uh, when it shouldn't be, other than just, just encryption that, that might be more uh, economic in the long run. So, so some researchers think that it's imperative that we fundamentally alter the dynamics uh, in cybersecurity through novel technologies and and new solutions. In fact, the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative, which the um, you know has been around for for several years, there's a federal R&D effort which is focused on you know game-changing research over the next uh, five to ten years. Some of it deals with uh, kind of moving target defenses, but some of it also is about socioeconomic you know kind of changes. How do we look at us um, as part of the problem and 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 get ahead of that? First off, are we spending enough on research? And are there some things that you think are important that we should be focusing on as a country? Well, I think that uh, so um, so spending uh, well spending uh, do we spend uh, enough on research? Uh, so I would say we have a problem, correct? 
So I don't know, I don't know if this is because we didn't invest enough in the past or whether we are not connected with the academia well enough uh, you know, to extract the most out of that side of the world. Uh, so I don't know how to answer on that. Um, I, I can say one thing that, uh, you know, because I come from that world, academia, and I can tell you that uh, in academia, especially in this country, there are the smartest and brightest people that I ever met in, you know, in my life. I mean, I come from Italy, you know, I was very well connected with all the universities in Europe. Came here 11 years, I work with the, the most uh, cutting edge universities, you know, <clears throat> with uh, tons of expertise in cybersecurity, and they know their stuff inside out. The problem is uh, when you look at the, the industry and the kind of solutions that we have in the market, uh, do we really, uh, you know, are we really taking advantage of this? So there is some kind of gap between academia and industry. So academia tend to have the tendency to come up with the greatest research, but they don't face uh, operational workflows. They do not understand the reality of you know, conditions, the reality of data, reality of implications of bad calls, and we need to help them you know, to adapt models, to adapt techniques that, that are more commercially ready, correct? In the industry, I think we already have uh, our hands full of problems and challenges. So we just, uh, I don't see any counter effect in opening up a little bit more and try to get uh, uh, more from academia. The, um, just kind of, a, of an interesting perspective, I don't know how many in the audience here has, uh, have been to, uh, or observe DEF CON Black Hat, right? You know, I don't know how many, but there are multiple nation state capabilities participating in DEF CON at <laughs> Black Hat, it's close enough. Um, so some of the top technologists in the world, um, literally they have high automation going on, they have um, almost hand-to-hand -hand combat in their approach, um, all of which um, there are many, many policies and laws that would restrict our country from operating in the way that game is operated. That's, that's not a restriction to the rest of the world, right? So I think there is a lot of work that has to be done on that policy side to decide what we will and won't do, because I'll tell you, that is the nature of the state of the art. And if for any of you that want to experience it, just go watch it, right? Because you'll, you'll see it, you'll see it firsthand in terms of how it really operates and how these folks really think. Um, we participate in, in Black Hat and DEF CON as well, and I totally agree, Steve. It's, uh, it's breathtaking uh, what uh, people are capable of. <clears throat> Look, we, we live in the greatest country in the world, and we're the great innovators in the world. We've outsourced our jobs and manufacturing and lots of things around the world. The one thing we do better than anybody is innovate. It's part of our culture. It's part of who we are. And I, I think both uh, on the security side, but just in general, it's really the ethos of, of our country. And I think we are on the cutting edge. And there are lots of examples of that playing itself out, uh, like at Black Hat and DEF CON, that we see capability that's breathtaking. Now, having said that, you know, it doesn't do you any good if you're the great innovator, but it's easy for somebody to take it. So I, you know, I think work needs to be done, as we've been talking about today, on protecting what we're building, protecting that innovation. Um, we, we, we're the R&D arm for China because we can develop it and they can take it. Um, so, um, and you know, all of us up here are either parts of, of companies. Um, you know, my company was acquired by General Dynamics, but GD acquired 20 others. Um, I know Raytheon and I know Boeing d does the same thing. Small innovative security companies are the R&D arms now of, of larger enterprises and defense contractors. It's phenomenal and we're finding a way to come together and unleash enormous capability, security capability, innovation in the marketplace that's really, really powerful. But we, we need to make sure as a country we can protect this innovation and right now that, to me, that's the long pole in the tent uh, around innovation. Is, is there a limit to the uh, amount of automation we can do uh, in this area? The speed with which the, is there an upper limit? Um, I don't think there's a limit. There may be a limit, a limit on what we're willing to live with, right, from a policy or trust standpoint. Right? I don't think it's an engineering problem. 
on Wall Street, they're trading in the you know nanoseconds. And yeah. I can tell you, it's like uh, uh, maybe if you have asked me like the same question three years ago, I would say I don't know. Uh, but uh, we successfully have proved that uh, uh, platforms and analytics uh, are ready today to take uh, the challenge. So. Well, great. I, you know, we, we've uh, we've come up on uh, time, but please join me. These guys have been awesome. Thank you for such uh, enlightening comments.